Hello to everyone uh, watching and listening tonight. This is Amateur Radio Roundtable. Today is August 11th, 2015. And my co-host, Ted Randall, is uh, with me tonight, WB8TUM. And I'm Tom Medlin, W5KUB. You notice I've got a new shack in the background. I'm not sure whose this is. I would like to know if anybody out there, this is your shack, please let me know. Uh, I think uh, it was someone in our chat room uh, this year. And I, I had the name, but I lost it. So it's a beautiful shack back there if you're looking at the shack. And uh, I would like to give credit to uh, whoever uh, whoever owns that beautiful shack there. And if you have uh, Radio Shack pictures and you'd like to send them in, uh, send them to us and uh, we'll try to use them on the show. Just a couple quick announcements. Uh, we got the uh, Huntsville uh, Ham Fest coming up uh, this coming weekend. We've been working pretty pretty hard the last couple weeks getting ready uh, but we'll be there uh, we're gonna go live Friday August the 14th in our drive the three and a half hour drive as we go down there we'll be streaming live and you'll see us uh, do some setup no telling who might walk by uh, during the setup uh, maybe there'll be someone you can recognize there but the uh, ham fest is the 15th and the 16th of August and we've got a lot of prizes. We've got 43 or 44 prizes to give away to our viewers. And we've got some nice ones again. Antenna analyzers and, and handy talkies and all kinds of things. So uh, be sure and tune in and uh, watch the webcast. All you got to do is be there if we call your name. we got Hambot working again. He's a little crippled, but he's working. He's getting better every day. And uh, if he calls your name, if you say I'm here, uh, you get the prize. So... Uh, that's uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, just uh, very quickly, again, we're thinking about kind of expanding the show with maybe a couple other segments. Uh, we're, we are talking to uh, Riley Hollinsworth uh, about a new segment. We might call it something like Ask Riley. I know there's a lot of interest in talking with Riley, so maybe we'll have a little 15-minute segment on uh, uh, maybe once or twice a month, and uh, you guys can call in. Uh, on the phones and talk to Riley. Now, there's going to be a special thing happening at uh, uh, the Hamfest Sunday about 3:30. I can't tell you exactly what that is. It's a big surprise. But if you if you watched last year, it's on Saturday. If you watched last year, you this you probably know what's happening. But I will say that we think the Blues Brothers are going to come by. The Blues Brothers are going to come by and visit us around 3.30 p.m. on Saturday. So you might really want to tune in for that. I think that's going to be be good. We also will be uh, uh, broadcasting the Young Ham of the Year Award at 2 o'clock on Saturday. And, hey, our co-host Ted Randall here, he's going to have his QSO show live from uh, the Huntsville Ham uh, Fest. Uh, so be sure and tune in there. Ted can give you the frequency in just a second. And uh, we, we're going to even try to uh, pipe his audio into, uh, into our webcast at times when he has some uh, special guests down there and uh, just uh, let you know what's going on. We've uh, built another cart up, a mobile cart, a video cart. So we hope to be able to move around a lot more than we have normally. So we're going to be uh, set up in multiple places so we can do a better job streaming for you guys. So, hey, hey, Ted, just real quick, uh, you, you got the frequencies you're going to be on there? Well, we're on the, just, we're actually just on one frequency during the day, and that's 9930, 9930. And uh, that's the daytime frequency for WTWW when we're broadcasting. And uh, so that's what we'll be on at, at Huntsville is on 9930. Okay, and it's always fun here. Ted always has uh, some interesting people on. So, guys, be sure and tune in uh, to uh, Ted there on uh, 9930. Uh, okay, well, let's, uh, let's talk about our first guest tonight. Uh, this is an interesting person I ran across. And let me, uh, let me try to get his video up here and uh, tell you a little about uh, this person here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Tim uh, Red. Uh, KK6VQQ, and Tim was licensed back in 1955. That was uh, a few years before I got my license. I didn't. I didn't come around to about 64. So he's got me beat by almost a whole decade there. But he was active for uh, five or six years. 
and um, and then he he uh, he became inactive and went to a fifty. Uh, I mean, he went to a five decade career uh, in things like uh, man, I don't know. He tried to explain it to me. I actually think he works for the CIA because I could never understand what he did. But he works. He worked in science and research labs, jet propulsion labs, biomedical labs. I think he tracked uh, all the genes and DNA and whatever. I have no idea what the guy did. If we have time, maybe he could touch on that. But uh, uh, he spent about 30 minutes the other day telling me what he did, and I didn't understand a word of it. But anyway, uh, all the way from San Diego, California, uh, how how you doing there, uh, uh, Tim? I'm good, Tom. Glad to be here. You're good to do uh, um I'm um, happy to be a uh, guest on your show here. Well, great. We're glad to have you. And um, uh, let's talk a little about ham radio. Man, you got started back in the 50s. I mean, that was the magic days. I remember my early days. It was fun. It was like magic, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. How about how about uh, get us rolling? Let me, I can do a fairly short sort of bird's eye or low earth orbit satellite overview. All right, of, we'll uh, go for it. Okay. <laughs> there, I th- we're talking about three periods here. Uh, my, my, uh, from about 55 to 60, which for me was my uh, junior high and high school, uh, graduating high school in 1960, actually in January of 61. Um, and then, then I started college and uh, really, just because of being real busy in college, uh, I, I, I think I renewed my license once, but I, I just didn't operate at all, and and that got into that that fifty approximately five decade uh, decades of inactivity as far as ham radio goes, and then the third period really started oh just a couple three months ago. Uh, the, oh, this and that got me interested. And long story short, uh, I've had my general, general license now. I passed the exam just a, about a week and a half ago. <laughs> so I'm, I'm in the process of, uh, of, uh, I've been a do it yourself or back that I was back then in those days. And I can talk more about that. And, uh, I love building things and that's the way I want to go now. And I can talk more about that. All right. But I, anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm putting a picture up here. Look, picture of you, uh, probably around age 13. Yeah. Now, yeah. man, look at that. Look at that gear. It looks like uh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Maybe a. I can a tell heat. you qu- quickly. I uh, right. Uh, well, uh, on the table, the thing to the on the left, the biggest box is an old uh, Heath kit. What was it? A AR3 or or AS3? I, I forget which. I, uh, 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 that was my first, uh, uh, besides building receivers prior to that, I had been, you know, like a lot of, like a lot of kids messing with old radios and TVs and scrounging stuff and playing. And I'd actually been listening to shortwave on, you know, people gave me, uh, there were a lot of all, all band radios, the kinds of things that could receive shortwave uh-huh. and I was fascinated by it. But anyway, in that picture, I obviously I just, it was my early days when, it, when I got my novice license and I can remember I, I had, I'd saved my money up and stuff. I had a paper out back in those days. And, uh, so that box is a Heath kit, uh, general coverage receiver, pretty lousy receiver. I improved that over the years, uh, sitting on top of the receiver is a Q multiplier, uh, there's something just to the right of it that I can't recognize, but I'm guessing was maybe an antenna tuner. Then the thing just to the right of the receiver, I believe is, it was a Heathkit VTBM. Right. I may have ha- had it plugged. I may have been using it as an S meter or something. Then there's a little tiny black thing like in the middle of the window. I remember that was I, my transmit receive switch. Then on the right, towards the right of the table, just to the right of that little black thing, is probably a one tube transmitter. I, I built uh, more than one of those, and cr- I can I can just barely make out crystals in front of it. Yeah, I um, see that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the yeah. old days with the crystals, wasn't it? 
Ted, did well, you ever have to, I, Ted, did you ever have to operate with crystals? Well, as a novice, uh, you had to, you know. Yeah, I was, I was asking if Ted ever, uh, uh, oh, oh. Ted may not have operated. I, I remember the old crystals, man, and let me tell you, you had, one or, two, you had one or two crystals, and, you know, you just call CQ and you tune around until you find somebody calling you back. You were never on the same well, frequency. Well, that was, that was where the terminology rock bound came from. Yeah. Right, right. Prior to VFOs of any kind, you were rock bound. And and there, there were, uh, I had a bunch of crystals probably on 40 meters. I believe I had a 40 meter dipole up, up in the outside at that time. And uh, so I had a handful of crystals that were loaned to me. They were passed on from another ham. And when I got my general and, 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 you know, was happy to get away from crystals, I passed them along to somebody else. That's kind of the way it went back then. Well, did you ever modify a crystal? I mean, you, you used to take toothpaste. <laughs> you could take toothpaste and open it up and polish it down with toothpaste and change the frequency. You ever do anything like that? I tried some of that. I even, I, I even had a little different thing, trying to squeeze the crystal and change its frequency a little bit. Those crystals, uh, they were in those cases where you could take off the cover and the crystal was held inside with a, a real stiff spring. Mm -hmm. And I took one real carefully and took the cover off and drilled a hole in it and mounted a nut and bolt thing. And anyway, had a, had a setup where with a screwdriver, I could, I could just barely turn it. I was playing with it. I don't think I ever got that to work. I think I you know, broke a couple of quartz slices by doing that kind of messing around. But hey, you know. <laughs> so, so you were you a DXer back then? Or? Uh, yeah, I I ended up trying it. Uh, I I uh, I I wasn't that good. Uh, basically, okay. The the picture you're showing is at the beginning of this approximately five year period. So that's when I was yeah. a novice. My best setup that I that I put together and this takes us to about 1960 when I was a, uh, when I graduated high school what I had running then was uh, there was an awful lot in those days there was an awful lot of surplus uh, World War II uh, equipment and the ARC-5 uh, series of, uh, of uh, uh, command sets uh, I'm going to hold a, a book up in front of me that I just bought on eBay. This is just a nostalgia thing for me. And, but on the, on the cover of this, that's what it looks like. And you, those things were available for about four or five bucks a piece all over the place. Mm -hmm. I, what I was running by last station, uh, and, and I was able to work some DX. I, again, as much, I did as much homebrew as I could. I had a much better receiver at that time. I had a, Drake had just started making receivers, and their very first receiver was the 1A. It, it wasn't nearly as good. You hear sometimes today that some people still like the the 2B and stuff, which was a much better receiver. But I had a Drake 1A receiver, a highly modified ARC-5 uh, uh, transmitter that I uh, – the, the best thing about it, uh, was the VFO was very stable. Those things were built like a tank. But I had uh, made it into a, a phasing single sideband exciter, and I'd built at, at that point uh, a, a homebrew linear with a tube I'd bought uh, from some surplus mm -hmm. joint. And that was I was running about 250 watts, and outside I had a, a 15 meter cubicle quad made of with uh, bamboo uh, fish poles and I uh, didn't have a rotator on it, but I, I could walk out to the back porch and use the Armstrong method of turning it. So I did my best to work DX and I had somewhere around, I don't know, maybe, maybe 25, 30 countries, but, but even I knew all the, all the hams in my neighborhood and a guy who just as an example, a, a, a guy who was one of my best buddies, he had a station that I, I couldn't compete with for a second. He had a 100-foot tower, a, a big uh, beam up there, a tri-band beam on a rotator, and he was running a, a full gallon, and uh, he worked DX all over the place. So I did the best I could yeah. with what I had. Well, let me, let me ask Ted some. Ted, did you, I, I don't really know all your background. Uh, I don't know if you started with a novice license or if you just jumped into higher licenses. Were you, were you ever a novice? 
Oh yeah. I was <laughs> well, you know, hey, when I was a novice, novice let me yeah. tell you, I, he, uh, Tim worked uh, a lot more DX than I did. I bet you, when I was a novice, I didn't work more than probably two or three stations. It was tough back in those days. Well, for me, it was it's, uh, you know, novice license to me was collecting cards to put on the wall. Yeah, yeah. I, I became obsessed with QSL cards. I didn't care where they were. I mean, <laughs> I just come in, sit down. It started pounding brass asking for QSL cards. I don't know. There may have been other people like that. Some people were thinking about DX. DX didn't even cross my mind, although I did wind up working some just inadvertently, you know, in the middle of the novice band, which I, I thought that was kind of cool. But I, I miss the novice band because I'm not, I'm not a fast CW person. I really, I really enjoyed that, that period of time of ham radio where people would actually get on there and creep a little bit, you know. Oh yeah, it was it was a fun day. I remember uh, watching for cards every day. You know, I got a new card in, man. Well, look, hey Tim, uh, what do you got there? You got a lot of uh, now now Tim. Tim uh, we, we don't have a lot of time here, but we got two things yeah. going here. Tim is going to show us some old stuff. Yeah. And then Tim is going to talk about he wants to build his new all his new sideband equipment using the uh, like uh, SDR technology. But he and he's going to tell us about that. He's wanting to put all the old meters and stuff and make it look like the <laughs> 30s and 40s on the outside. So tell us what you got there, uh, Tim. Yeah, I, I you see, I just uh switched my uh view uh to uh, uh another camera. And by the way, with this, I'm gonna try uh, I can uh zoom and pan this this view and uh. What I've done is I've I've spread a whole bunch of stuff out on it. Uh, uh, the, the, this is this is a, 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 a pan back view. Uh, I can zoom in and pan right and left. And I'll try to do a little bit of that while I'm talking, but but how how well I can manage that and chew gum at the same time I'm not sure. But I'll do the best I can. Okay, real quickly, and, and I, I will tell you about my current plans in a minute, but let me, let me just, while I have this picture up, uh, give you a brief over, overview. I, I, I won't, uh, I identify every item in there. There's quite a bit there, but, uh, very quickly as an overview, you're looking at about a hundred years, uh, worth of, uh, uh, a, a delta of about a hundred years of technology. Um, right in the center, of the picture is an old uh, Atwater Kent uh, radio. Um, and that's not the most collectible or anything, but uh, I, I, I did have a, a radio collection going back some 20, 25 years. And I was into that and restored a couple. Um, I got a bunch of tubes that are kind of fun. I'll zoom in on some of them in a minute, but you can see there's a black box, a black panel thing sitting uh, right on top of that at water can't let me do a little bit of a zoom in now oh we can see it i can see it really well. okay okay yeah and that's a homemade thing that's something i made about 25 years ago and there's a big uh glass tube on top of it i'm going to turn the brightness down a little so it'll make that tube a little more visible on top and uh, i still anyway against the white wall it's hard that that tube is part of that I, I built that case kind of in the style of the old radios it's a wood case and a and a just a, a plain uh black uh panel the the tube on top is a big old tube that i got somewhere in those uh, back in about 25 years or so ago i, I buddied up with a guy who had a neon shop uh, and he did neon signs this was in providence rhode island um, and I got him, you can hardly see it until I zoom in on it, but I got him to make me a little coil of neon and I got into that tube by, um, by taking the base apart. Uh, let me see. here we go. Here we go. I'm trying to zoom in on that tube. There's, there you can see a little better. Yeah, it's too dark. It needs to be lighter. Yeah, bring us yep. some light. Get that in a second. Here we go. All right, okay. good. Looking good. Better. Okay. Yeah. Um, I I broke my way into that tube. That tube is mounted 
to the box. Uh, the top panel of the box has a hole cut out. I broke my way into that tube, you know, removed the bottom thing, uh, a circular disc that had the pins, and I ended up uh, then then uh, there w- the bottom of the glass was exposed, and I I managed to break the bottom of the glass, got into the tube, pulled out what was basically the the guts of it. The the, the plate is what you see up above going to the mm-hmm. plate connector on the top. And my friend, my neon friend, made a coil that you can kind of see. I'm going to try to I'll see the coil. I, I, it's very yeah. clear. I can see it in okay. the tube there. All right. That's good. That's a, that's a neon coil. And then in there's nothing inside the box except a little solid state um, uh, uh, neon neon transformer basically that that runs the coil mm-hmm. and and so that was just a fun kind of artsy craftsy project I made with old stuff um, uh, so that's what you got there and then sitting to the right just sitting on top of it are are two things I got my little uh, magician's pointer this is a really interesting coil I showed you this uh, the other night Tom mm-hmm. I'll, I'll bring it close. And and uh, it's kind of fun to look at in a second. Over on the other side is a what's called a blue Arcturus. Uh, th- those are tubes from from the 1920s. Um, the the blue ones, all it is is blue colored glass. They're four pin tubes, mm-hmm. um, blue colored glass, and gives it its name. But those are kind of collectible. And then if you see just to the right of it, kind of sitting there leaning over a little bit is the, physically the biggest tube I have. I'm actually going to go and pick that up for a second so I can do this without busting up my whole display. This thing, this is, this is one of my pride and joy items. Uh, it's the biggest tube I have. And I was going to tease Ted and, and say, you know, with your, big old hundred thousand watt rig that you run on short wave. I'm, I'm tempted to, to use this in the final for what I'm going to build. That's a joke, folks. I'm kidding. Yeah. The first, there's a whole bunch of reasons why that's not going to happen. Maybe the first one is that this is, this is only a diode. It's a rectifier. <laughs> I'm going to put it. Joe, down. You know, it, it, lo- it looks an awful lot like a 250 TH. You know, I, Okay, I'm not going to try now due to time. Uh, yeah, that's what I thought too. They're they're very similar. Um, I I did at some point. The reason I'm I, I'm saying it's a diode with some confidence is I got curious and some time back uh, I I really I really carefully looked with a magnifying glass and. I was able to find a number on it somewhere, not on the base, but on the glass, and that, and then I ended up looking that up, and and I I, I thought I convinced myself that it was some sort of a diode, but anyway. Um, so so uh, uh, Tim, back the camera a little bit. I was looking at those old meters you had there. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Weston, yeah. I think uh, the Weston meters. Yep. Let, I'm gonna let's move over and uh, look at a couple of meters. There we go. We go like this. Okay. There's some. There's some more tubes on the on the top shelf, and uh, and uh, behind them are are some of those nice uh, uh, dials and things. Oh uh, yeah, I see the dials on the wall there. The old old dials. Yeah. 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 There you go. I'm gonna uh, uh, just a little bit going to be panning down in a second and we'll get to the meters here here we go we got a guy in a uh, chat room here said he has a one tube home brew receiver that has a bright brightson true blue tube in it so that's that's cool uh, more more tubes there on that shelf uh-huh. and then go, going down some more there's there's some meters and uh i i have a soft spot in my heart for those fan shape uh those are western meters and Kind of, you know, the really old, it seems like in the real old science fiction movies and stuff where you'd see racks of equipment, those were the kinds of meters that, that you'd see. <laughs> yeah, you anyway, see that um, in, uh, you know, the, the uh, horror movies there where they're, you know. Like, right. Yeah, yeah. Right. 
Okay, and then a, a little more down there. Now, now we're starting to see a couple more, some knobs and dials and things. Um, uh, let's see, well, tell you what, I, 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 I am having a little trouble panning and talking at the same time. Let me kind of sort of finish my, my story, and I'll, I, I'll, I will move it around. We can look at more parts, but I'm starting to be conscious of, of your time, Tom. Um, to sort of bring my story up to date, um, I, I, I spent my career working, basically working in research labs. That started, that started actually almost my first day of college. I managed to get myself hired on. I went to the University of Michigan and, and, and managed to get a job when I was a freshman, um, in, in a lab, uh, uh, that was actually w working on, uh, uh, spacecraft components. Hey, Tim, uh, let's get the camera. Try, let's get the camera back on you. I, uh, I, oh, I, okay. I want to see you while you're talking here. Uh, okay, here we go. There we go. Okay. Oh, right, yeah, good. Got it. So okay, you were working yeah. in the, the space industry. Uh, yeah, I got I got a part time job while I was a student. Uh, um, I got lucky. I, uh, I remember that I, I worked one day. Uh, when I started University of Michigan, I worked one day bussing tables in the dormitory cafeteria, and I had just registered for all my classes, had all my books, classes were going to start the next week, didn't have anything to do for a couple of days, and I just got bold with, with my experience under my belt at that point, which was my ham, basically my ham radio career, uh, and a lot of, you know, well, uh, playing around as a kid with electronics, but, but what kind of job experience is that? You know, I don't know. Anyway, I, I, I went, I, I went to a floor. Michigan's a big school. I, I found a floor in the engineering building where all the uh, professors, uh, double E professors offices were. And I just walked down that hallway till I found uh, a door that was open and I looked inside and there was a man sitting at his desk. He was alone. And I just quietly, I knocked on the door and introduced myself. And anyway, I basically told my story really quickly and said, I was looking for a job uh, and I had no idea. So he, he talked with me a little bit. Basically he said, what are you doing for the next couple hours? And I said, nothing. He said, come with me. We went, he took me, went down to his car. He drove me a short ways away to a laboratory. Uh, I remember, actually remember the name of it, it was Space Physics Research Lab. It, it was a small place. It was a building a mile or two away from the main campus. And he took me inside, introduced me to some people. And long story short, when we left that lab that day, I had a job. I had a part-time job uh, as a technician. The very next day, I went in and quit my job bussing tables in the dormitory. So and then the way it's gone my whole career is one, one job has always led to another. Call it networking or mm -hmm. referrals or that kind of thing. So I went through five decades that way from one place to another. Uh, Labs, always in a, I love science, uh, different kinds of science, and I, I always worked in research labs in a variety of different areas of science, but the connecting thread through everything is, is signal processing. I, I, I like to say that, that all the different things that I've done, I, I, I somehow or other, worked on improving signal to noise ratio another way of saying what my specialty was in, in, as an engineer was uh um scientific visualization so um and that uh, topic wise yeah you mentioned a couple of things i worked uh, probably my all-time favorite job was at yale medical school i worked there for three years in the genetics department that was right at the point where the human genome project had gotten funded so i'll kind of stop stop with with that uh, to jump up to the present and a, and a real quick overview because because uh 
why don't we talk ham radio here? <laughs> yeah, let's <laughs> talk, talk about, about. Yeah, I think now we, we're, yeah. we're going to get into we're going to get into the new Current ham plan. now. You just got your license last week. Now you right. told me you live in a uh, an apartment on the eighth floor. They're very right. restrictive, so you can't put antennas out or anything like that. So what are you going to do? Here's what I'm going to do. Um, uh, uh, probably just about everyone's familiar with the, these little El Cheapo, um, uh, uh little dongles that cost, cost 15, 20 bucks uh, that you can plug in and and – into your computer and use it as a, a software to find radio. Um, okay, these things, they have a sort of a lower limit uh, on the frequencies they can receive. They go way, way up high. For reasons that are just my own personal passion, my own desire, um, what I want to do is I, I, I want to go, go the extra mile and I want to get myself on the high frequency bands so we're talking 80 through 10, basically, and I want to do sideband. Okay, first receiver. Uh, this is a thing that uh, there you you can find YouTube videos all over the place. This is this is called the Ham It Up converter, and this simply up converts the lower frequency range uh, up to what this thing can handle. So if you just put these together, here's a little connecting cable. I, this I've already used. It works great. So you're and gonna just, have you're gonna build a, your your receiver is gonna actually be a software defined receiver. That's what you right. you're gonna try My to use. My receiver is this plus uh, th there's there's several several software defined receiver uh, pieces of software around. I don't have to write my own. I can just use yeah. one that's ready made. And I've already had that running. So my receiver part, in, in, in essence, is done, except there's some little tweaks and modifications that I'm going to be able to make, but we'll get that in a second. But the easiest part for me to describe is right, you're seeing it right here in front of, front of you is this. All right. Second easiest, uh, you, you, when I was on the other camera shot, you probably saw a brass coil in the back and here's another one i'm going to build two magnetic loops uh i've done a bunch of research on the internet and i've never had a magnetic loop before my circumstances are 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 pretty tight i i live in a a, a teeny little um uh uh place a little uh, uh, uh efficiency apartment a one room thing but i'm but I'm up eight stories in the air, so at, at least I have a shot out my my windows, which are facing east. So I'm in San Diego, as you said, so I can see the rest of the country, uh, so to speak, out my windows. What I don't know is how much of a Faraday cage I'm, I'm living in. Where I live, there, 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 it's kind of like having a really strict landlord. I can't put up any kind of antennas outside at all. Now, I've done a lot of research, and, and, and apparently people, for an in, indoor antennas, these magnetic loops, they, they, they have some really interesting properties. One of them is that they're, they're, they're relatively immune to, to noise. Uh, basically, it's a really high Q circuit. You have to, it, it's a tuned circuit. You, you make yourself a big loop of copper. Uh, here's an example of a, of a variable capacitor I, I got. And this, the, the plate spacing is a little wider on this than on a receiving capacitor, but I'm only planning on running QRP power, five, 10 watts maximum. One of the downsides of these magnetic loops is is they generate tremendous voltage. Even if you're even at power levels of like five or ten watts, you can be generating voltages. Uh, you make the loop a, a copper loop, and then it's broken at one point, and that's where the capacitors go. And the you can generate across that gap voltages that are in, like in the thousands of volts basically so um even if i wanted to run more power that's one thing i'd have to do is use huskier stuff Pe people get vacuum variable capacitors with higher voltage rating stuff like that but i'm i'm going for low power so, so tim okay we've talked about you're going to start out with a magnetic antenna you're going to use right. a sd uh, uh software defined right. radio 
And right. are you going to build your sideband transmitter yourself, yeah. right? Yeah, that that's where I'm going to do considerable work. Uh, last little bit of explaining the central uh, piece in 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 that puzzle I'm holding right in front of me now. Uh, th there's there's a lot of uh, people are okay. This this is a um, it, uh, it's called a DDS uh, uh, discrete digital synthesizer, I think. Um, something like that i forget what the acronym is but basically this one is a little fan okay this this here's another one that's more common a lot of people are using these now you can build a very stable vfo it's real easy to take something like this use it with an arduino um um i'm gonna so so how are you going to get this sideband signal out now? I got a picture here. I got a picture that you sent me. This is back the old days. I think this is something you use to to pull that sideband oh, yeah. signal out with, right? Yeah, yeah, that that phasing thing. The, here's uh in real broad brushstroke terms um the the magic of generating single sideband you're doing two things uh you're uh, that are to to make to get single sideband instead of am one is you're nulling out the carrier and secondly you're you're retaining and and transmitting only one of the sidebands so it turns out that in broad brush stroke terms you can do two of those two things at the same time by using what's called the terms quadrature and IQ, which are basically the the real and imaginary components of of looking at the signal as a complex number. But uh, this uh, is a uh, will basically be the the VFO, the, the right, thing right. Ge generating the RF. And this one, one, one way in which this is a little nicer than some of the ones that folks are using is this, this one just gives you out of two, two of these little these caps are just covering up little connectors, little what are called SMA connectors. Um, you need, you're combining audio and RF, uh, the audio is the speech. Um, you need both of them at, uh, at 90 degrees. This, uh, it's, it, it's, it's relatively easier with the RF because all you've got is a sine wave. I mean, it's going to be at one frequency or another, but, but when you're sitting there on a certain frequency, you've got two sine waves, 90 degrees out of phase, not too tough. Um, uh, the harder part is the audio because if you think about it, it's not, you can't just do it with a time delay because that means 90 degrees out of phase at every frequency and, and, the audio range, you know, roughly up to two and a half kilohertz. Um, well, so you know, that, you know, Tim, that, you're, that, that, you're starting to talk over, I think, my head and some other head here. Hey, okay, here's what I'd okay. like to. Here's what we'd like to do. I'd like right. to kind of keep up with you as you make progress on this project. When you get certain pieces working, we'll get you back on a show, and you can show, you know, your progress. Here's my transmitter. Here's my receiver. Here's my loop, and let us know how well it works. Okay. You got it. I'd be happy to, Tom. And not only that, one thing I, I'm, I'm going to hold up another one of my little goodies while I'm saying this last little piece. This, this is this I've had for a zillion years since my college uh, uh, undergraduate days. This is an ancient TV to camera tube. Wow, <laughs> and yeah, so, yeah. somebody somebody gave me and once in a while you see these selling on eBay, not for very much. I see them for maybe 30 yeah. bucks or so. Uh, but to yes. Uh, so let's I, let's do that, Tim. We're gonna we need to move on to our next right. segment. Uh, but I, I, I think I what you've given us here is a lot of good information, and I, I'm sure a lot of people are going to want to follow this. I, I'm really interested to see how it's going to work out for you. I'm going to do more more than that. I, I'd be very very happy to come back and with progress reports. But one thing I've done myself, I I, I know I'm launching into uh, an ambitious. Set really a set of projects, and 
I haven't always been very good at documenting projects of my own. I mean, hobby things, not talking about work things. And I've, I've told myself this time I'm going to do it. That means I'm going to start producing a lot of YouTube videos of piece by piece. Um, and so. That, okay. I, we'll, I, uh, we'll show them on here. Right. Right. You got it. So, hey, yeah. Ted, did, uh, Ted, did, uh, seeing any of those old parts or anything bring back any old memories, uh, in your ham radio days? Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> you see things like analog meters and, uh, those tubes. I, 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 I looked at that one large tube he held up and I swear to heavens, it looked like a, a 250 TH. I, I don't know. I guess yeah, and I yeah. don't know. I, I had one of those in an amplifier. I actually had a pair of them in an amplifier. Uh, I'm holding up uh, now just, just for fun, a little teeny, this is a SWR, uh, uh, the, the guts of what's in an SWR meter, you know, a couple of toroids and diodes it's from a neat place called kits and parts. And so just the way I like to combine new and old is I love the idea of building an SWR meter using a couple of those Weston fan meters and making it look crazy. Well, so here, yeah. And here's what, here's what's uh, very interesting about this. And then we've got to go. You're going to build up this new modern technology ham radio, but you're going to try to make the outside look old and right. like like antique, right? You're going to try to use old knobs, exactly. old meters, and things like that. Yes, yes. That would be really interesting. Well, Tim, thank you very much for coming on here. We're going to get back with you here pretty soon. Ted, any any uh, closing remarks there you want to make? I, I, I'm just anxious to see the completed project because it sounds like he's <laughs> – He's definitely on a roll here. You well, know, and, you know, hey, uh, I'm, I'm a I, I, the other thing I think what's going to be really interesting is I think there's going to be a lot of people that's going to want to talk to you, Tim, and, uh, you know, and talk to you as to how you did this. I think uh, the magnetic loop antenna itself is going to be something that's going to generate a lot of interest, let alone all the other, uh, you know, the, I, I guess I want to call it tiny paraphernalia that makes up a receiver. <laughs> And a transmitter today. So uh, I think you're going to have a lot of takers. A lot of folks going to be saying, Tim, how do I do this? How do I do that? Show me how to do this. Sounds like fun, may maybe. <laughs> All right. Well, save me through, Tim, and uh, enjoyed having you on here. we got to get our next guest on. Thank you very Send much for being you. with us. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you. All right. Well, Ted, while I get our next guest on, uh, you got any announcements or anything you want to make here? Go right ahead. You know, I wish I had an announcement to make. Yeah. Could I just make well, up something? You know? <laughs> well, let me that's, see. You know, that's what you, that's what you, it depends on what it well, is, right? Now. Yeah, um, let's see. Now, other than Huntsville, Huntsville coming up this weekend, you know, folks need to, a lot of folks probably are sitting there thinking to themselves, well, I don't know, you know, but you just got to get up and go, you know, you got to get up and go. You got, you know, once you get there, you're going to really enjoy yourself. And, uh, that's that inertia. I mean, I, I'm like that too. A lot of times I'm like, ah, I don't know. I want to. Then afterwards, uh, I think about the inertia and I think, well, if I hadn't have gone, um, look what I would have missed out on. And everybody needs a break. Everybody needs to get away. So, and, uh, from the routine of things. So Joe, are you on here with us? I hope so. Oh, okay. I, your picture's not moving, but you're there. We'll, uh, Okay, we've got, we've got Joe, uh, K0NEB with us. Uh, but Joe, your video is not working, so I'm not sure okay. what we're going to do here. Maybe Hold we on to... a second, let me. Okay, I think, that, well, it stopped again. While you're playing with that. Okay, how's that? Let's look. It's, uh, thinking. We're thinking. <laughs> there you are. Is it, you got it there, uh, Ted? I don't. I, I don't have it yet. He must be closer. Oh, there he got it. It's okay. Buffering. Hey, let me there make a go. couple. Let me make a couple other just quick announcements here, uh, real quick. Uh, uh, just oh, hey, and let's just tell everybody. First of all, uh, this is the the program tonight is being simulcast on powerful shortwave radio station WTWW on 5085 kilohertz for all you uh, ham radio operators that, that are watching on the. Uh, the webcast 5085 in case you want to tune in and for all you people out there listening in shortwave around the world you might want to go to w5 
kub.com. That's W5 Kilo Uniform Bravo.com. And you can actually see Ted here, the person you hear all the time. You'll get to see Ted's face. And Ted, your, your makeup's off just a little bit right here on the left side. You might want to. You might want to get that. You yeah, to, I, you know, I just cannot find the correct shade of lipstick. You know, that looks good on. Well, just camera. right there on that one little look, side, and you'll be, be okay. Right. So, hey, back back to back to my announcement there. Uh, so, if you're listening on shortwave, go to w5kub.com, tune in, watch the show. If you're a ham radio operator, tune in on your radio here, 50, 85 kilohertz. And I just want to say something else. You know, we changed our chat room here recently. Uh, and I think uh, people are starting to get used to it now. It's been relatively easy, but it's uh, it's a chat. The chat room is provided to us by Digital uh, Addiction. Digital Addiction, and uh, they're they're uh, they're some great guys. They they jump through hoops to help us get this thing going. We had a very short time before the Huntsville Ham Fest is coming up uh, this week. We needed the chat room working, and they've been over backwards and really helped us there at Digital Addiction. Uh, they've got a, a network. It's an IRC network, and uh, they would like to ask, and we're asking that everybody out there, uh, please use this chat room, the W5KUB.com chat room, or actually on IRC, it's it's uh, pound uh, W5KUB, and let's use it for technology. If you want to talk about things like Arduino or or, or uh, computers or, or radios or anything, electronics, uh, get on there and use it. Let's try to get some activity going uh, every day, all day. Uh, there's no need for the uh, uh, chat room to be uh, to be silent there. I would really like to build that up. And uh, uh, Digital uh, Addiction is going to be helping us uh, uh, at Huntsville uh, to get the network up there. So we're looking forward to... Uh, our webcast here uh, this weekend. So let's uh, let's jump over to uh, Joe K zero N E B, and he is where are you? You're in Lincoln, aren't you? Lincoln, Lincoln Nebraska, capital yeah. city, home of the Huskers, of course. Yeah. So hey, you got anything uh, interesting to show us tonight about kit building? What, what's what do you got I going? I always have lots of interesting things. First off, I will see everybody in Huntsville. I fly down on Thursday. This time I'm actually flying from Lincoln instead of Omaha, so uh, hopefully we'll have a nice smooth trip. Uh, I've got lots of kits and stuff to show. First off, we'll kind of go back to one of the things our previous guest mentioned. Uh, that is. Uh, the software-defined radio made from those little sticks. Uh, this is a uh, um, Ranverter Pi, and what it is is it has two inputs. You'll see uh, an F connector, and then you'll see an RCA connector. The RCA connector is for HF, the F connector is for VHF and UHF, and what it is is it's that same typical 25 to 1800 megahertz SDR, but uh, can, can you uh, use it, the up converter with that? It has the up converter built into this kit. This oh. kit is called the Ranverter Pi, and it comes with the uh, um, the SDR stick as well as everything else except for the Raspberry Pi case because it does fit in a Raspberry Pi case, and it works especially with the newer Raspberry Pi two uh, Bs. Uh, you can actually use the Pi to decode them. I've been using my PC, and there is a way to command it through your PC or through the Pi to switch through uh, the circuit that's in this to be HF or uh, the higher frequencies. So are, are you telling me and that's a receiver? Is, is, that's a receiver right there? Yeah, that's a receiver, and uh, it's only $49 for this thing, including the SDR uh, stick. And it is a kit, but as you can see, it's pretty simple. Um, it's not hard at all to uh, put together. There's no surface mount parts. Um, an experienced builder can probably make this thing in about an hour and a half with no problem at all. Um, like I said, it's 49 bucks, and you get it through a place called Hayseed Hamfest. Hayseedhamfest.com is where that kit's available. And like I said, it's 49 bucks. 
But, you know, kit building doesn't have to be expensive. In fact, it, it, it can get pretty inexpensive. Show me something for four bucks. This is your $4 CW transceiver. Now, this is an actual CW transceiver, and it sells for actually under four bucks if you buy more than one at a time. Now, the cool thing about this is it's crystal controlled, so uh, you can put crystals in for any frequency in the 40 meter band because this is a 40 meter version. But there are already uh, conversions, you know, different parts um, tables to change a couple of the uh, band specific parts to work on about anything from 80 to uh, 10 meters. Now, if you look in the middle, there's a little tiny pot in the middle, and what that does is it varies the frequency about 2 kilohertz. So you're not really stuck on the one frequency. You can move around. Now, what's interesting also is the design of this kit has extra holes in the board underneath the big connectors so that you don't have to install the like the big coax connector on the board. Instead, you can uh, put it on the box and then run wires and you can see underneath there there's some extra holes underneath there to hook the wires same thing with the power connections and the pot can be mounted elsewhere now of course you're not going to want to put a little uh, trimmer pot which kind of is your VFO um, on the front panel instead you use a regular pot and I think they're like 50k uh, it's like a 50k pot and uh, uh, so you can find a regular pot and you can put it on your uh, case and so on and build this like into an Altoids tin or something like that. So, or hey, you can hey, have Joe, all the parts on Joe, the one board and Joe, it's four bucks. Look, look at what I've got. Let's see. I'll bet that's the same kit. Yeah, yeah. Now I put it together and, and uh, hey, you might want to comment now. When I got this, the instructions for putting this together wasn't, wasn't very clear. They were in Chinese. But you, you can use the parts list, and the parts are kind of numbered to help you. Do, you. do you have any trouble with that? No, I didn't at all. But, uh, of course, I'm a little more experienced builder. Uh, and you'll find out that all the resistors are vertical. And then I put a uh, two-pin machine socket uh in the place where the crystal goes so I don't solder the crystal down I can actually unplug the crystal and put in different ones so uh, like this one is a 7040 crystal which is a popular QRP watering hole um, so it's a it's an excellent little deal and if if you're into things like uh, QRP and so forth it's great the other thing is if you're into being like a prepper or something it's kind of a neat little thing to keep in a metal box and in, in your storm shelter or whatever uh, kind of an interesting little gadget let me, let uh, me say one thing about that real quick and it was in a chat room uh, Glenn Papel uh, you know the author of the Arduino for ham radio book He's been yeah, on our show a number of times. Person in Huntsville. Yeah, he's been on our show a number of times, and we'll have Glenn on probably again soon. But he is taking that same little trans transceiver you got there, and he's packaged it in a nice little thing with Arduino and and the the DD what DDS uh, or whatever you call yeah. it uh, VFO, and I think he's got uh, JT65 running in it, and it's got a built-in keyer, and all this stuff is built in that little box. So. So uh, he took that same uh, same transceiver you're talking about there and uh, built it in there. Into JT65. Now, here's an interesting kit. This one comes from a place called banggood.com. And this is a Chinese source that I get a lot of these kits from. Um, I don't know how well you can see this. Can see it's it. a clock. Yeah. It's a clock. This kit sold for like, I think it was $3.86. Pretty darn amazing considering the same kind of kit I've seen before for like $20, $25. This is $3.85, I think, something like that. Definitely a little under 4 bucks. And believe it or not, that includes postage from China. Uh, yeah. Just amazing. Uh, this kit I put together in uh, about an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, you can see the little round spot to put in the uh, coin battery which is right there. That's to keep it going in case the power flickers. And then you put your power in here, which is DC, um, anything from 5 to 12 volts. Uh, you can power it up. It is not ho hooked up right now. Do they provide um, do They provide the battery with it? No. 
Okay. No, but it's the same battery, the CR2032, that uh -huh. you get anywhere for remote, remote controls. And this is the circuit board for a clock kit I got from them also. And this clock has like 60 LEDs around the outside. And it's got like about 30 surface mount parts in there too. So I'm going to be dealing with a lot of surface mount. And I got the acrylic uh, case for this too. It's going to be a beautiful little clock with a Bluetooth app and everything that controls it. And I think it was around $12. So uh, pretty amazing stuff for not a lot of money. Um, wow. But once again, you're right. Uh, a lot of the instructions are not in English. Uh, but the parts diagrams are pretty clear, and you can pretty well figure out how to run it. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. the circuit board for this clock, and this one is around 12 bucks. Um, uh, let's see what else we have. Hey, we've got we've got uh, uh, Matt and David in here with us also. They're in uh, Lebanon, Tennessee. Uh, if they want to yell it, jump in here at any time. Uh, just jump in here. I don't know if you guys, uh, Joe, have you met Matt? And, uh, yes, I have. Okay, uh, I have good. seen him at many ham fests and uh, hope to see him maybe at Huntsville if he makes it down. Well, they're going to be there. Okay. And, and uh, look, Matt, look how Matt wears his uh, headphones there. He's, he's got this technique. <laughs> I'm trying he, to let uh, I guess I've seen David. I haven't seen Matt yet in yeah. person, but I have seen David before. Yeah. Um, uh, our previous guest mentioned kits and parts. Uh, this kit came from him. Of course, they don't supply the case. This was one called the Pig Rig, and this was designed for the uh, Flying Pigs QRP Club. And so the four-state QRP group uh, made this label to put on your case and put a dial on it that says 7.122, which is the frequency that the four-state QRP group hangs out on. Now, that's not a real uh, digital readout, right? That's just a picture? Yeah. It's just a picture okay. on the panel but if you look inside this is a five watt uh qrp transceiver like what we like to call it a qrp gallon mm -hmm. and we'll see if we can zoom in it uses a copper hose clamp um a u-shaped hose clamp that's been flattened out and drilled as the heat sink for the two final output transistors so uh pretty interesting the way it works. Uh -huh. uh, are you still hearing me? I'm just hearing yeah. a little bit. Yeah, noise. I hear you fine. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, but it, it has a, a switch to control the uh, uh, keyer functions and so forth, uh, on off volume control, a place to plug your paddle in, your RF, uh, and mm -hmm. your uh, speaker or headset jack. So uh, this was made by them. They're, he's come out with a new one called the One Water, which is a uh, one watt version, but it has a lot more surface mount parts in it, but a, a better receiver. And he's just mailing those now, and I should have mine in a few days, and so that'll be another project. But that's from Kits and Parts, which he just mentioned. Um, let's see what else. Uh, also from China. This is kind of obnoxious looking. This is, <laughs> yeah, I haven't unwrapped it yet. This is an AM FM radio kit. I think I have it upside down. There we go. It's an AM FM radio kit. Once again, no instructions in English, but there's a schematic diagram, and the parts are numbered, and a list of what each part number is, and the board is pretty well marked. But this makes an AM FM radio, and this kit, runs on, believe it or not, two D-cell batteries, three volts, but it's two D-cell batteries. It's an AM, FM radio, nine bucks, just nine bucks. So it makes a great kit yeah. to get somebody started in kit building. Can you, uh, can you read that model number for us across there? Um, what model this oh, is? On the bottom of the radio across there. It, it just says Chow Wachi. <laughs> I don't know. It's all in Chinese. Now I was going to see but, if you could speak Chinese there. Yeah. No, I can't. Uh, I might be able to push out a little Spanish and maybe a little Yiddish, but uh, right. no Chinese. Um, finally, um, if you want an oscilloscope, you're going to spend some money, right? Yeah. Tell us about an inexpensive oscilloscope. How about an inexpensive oscilloscope? This is lit up right now. It's on the internal test generator, so I don't know how good this is going to show up. Oh, it's up. perfect. Good, good. I want one. Uh, actually, I have it upside down. Uh, that right. should look a little better. Um, when I first wrote about this for CQ Magazine, and it will be featured in the September issue, 
uh, this kit sold for twenty three ninety five. It is now twenty, uh, a little over twenty dollars, but for twenty three ninety nine, you can get it. It has all the surface mount parts pre-mounted for you, and all you have to do is the through hole, and it's still only about twenty three bucks. They just cut the cost of the version of it that uh, you have to do the surface mount. But I don't know how clear that is. It's clear. The the the, uh, the square wave is really clear. Um, the little noise in there is just from noise on the power supply and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is it has a mode. Uh, you can measure the frequency. You can measure the width of the pulses, the frequency of the signal that you have, the peak-to-peak -peak and RMS voltage all digitally like your Tektronix scopes do, all for 23 bucks postpaid sent from China. And this one, yeah, you're not going to, even if all the surface mount stuff is done, you're going to spend a couple hours putting it together. But look what you get when you're done. You have a scope, a color scope, and a pretty darn precise one at that. So uh, this one is pretty spectacular, and I really, really recommend it. Um, I also have one, and I don't have it within reach of me, that is a um, component tester, and that was written about in the magazine as well. And the component tester has a digital display, although the newer version of it has a small screen, and they do run on the same kind of processor they use for the Arduino. How about this one right here? Um, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. I think and you told me about it, and I ordered one, Joe. And it, yeah, it's really got, any any you component got, you put in there, it tests it, and it'll draw a picture on there, a transistor, whether it yeah, be a draws the schematic symbol. Yeah. Uh, you got the newer one that has the ZIF socket and stuff on it, and it gives the schematic symbol and tells you which wires, which leads of that component are in which pin, so right. you don't have to worry about which way it's hooked up. It analyzes it tells you, oh, that's an inductor, it's two microhenries, and it's between pins two and three. It's pretty amazing, and when you're building kits like these Chinese ones that some of the parts may have the numbers rubbed off or something, mm -hmm. it's a great help to tell you what that is. It'll tell you if the transistor's a MOSFET, if it's an NPN, a PNP, a thyristor, an SCR, all sorts of different devices, a thyristor, it will identify all those parts. It'll tell you if it's a diode, uh, it'll tell you if it's a resistor. Uh, it'll tell the capacitors uh, what value it is and what the equivalent series resistance is, which tells you if that capacitor is any good or not. All right. Well, Joe, which, they're asking you know, in the chat for, room, uh, where do you bucks, get that? What, what's the frequency range of that scope? Uh, the scope, this one, is only about 200 kilohertz. Oh. Uh, there's uh, better versions coming out that will be 1 or 2 megahertz shortly from what I'm told. But this one's only about 200 and some kilohertz, but it's great for troubleshooting audio and uh, amplifier circuits and so forth and looking for different uh, signal issues. Uh, but it's probably not real valuable for RF. But once again, it's only 23 bucks. And like I said, give it a few months, and there'll probably be a version that'll do two to five megahertz or so, and then you're getting into RF again. Uh huh. Okay. All right. Well, Joe, we, we. I'm going to be at Huntsville, uh -huh. and I'm going to be giving two seminars. One will be at one o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday. It'll be with the QRP seminars, which will be over in the Embassy Suites. And then at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, I do it all over again, kind of a slightly different version of the same presentation, and it will be in the VBC uh, across from the uh, main exhibit hall. Well, so I'll be doing that, and uh, I'll be taking pictures of the Young Ham of the Year presentation, and we're doing a Wolf Hong, the Royal Order of the Wolf Hong ceremony at 10 o'clock on Saturday night in the Embassy Suites, and that's a lot of fun. All right. Well, be sure and come by and see us. I know we'll be seeing you there. Uh, Joe, thanks very much for uh, showing us all those uh, different kits and things tonight. Let me jump down. Uh, let me jump over. Uh, listen, what do you got there, Joe? What, last, what was the last package? Okay, this is one of those clock kits. That's how it comes in the bag. Okay. All you get is a diagram, but like I said, most of the directions are in Chinese, but you do get a diagram and a parts list, and uh, it wasn't hard to put together at all. Just got to keep in mind there's three little white lines on the kit that 
aren't really explained, and those are uh, jumpers. So you'll have to put wire jumpers across those terminals. All right. Well, great. Very good, Joe. Thanks a lot for sharing all that with us. Hey, let's jump down to Lebanon real quick. Let's let's talk with David a while and and, and Matt there. And what what do you guys got going on? Well, I think uh, WBAPOM needed to go take a break, so I don't know where he went to, but. Yeah, I, 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 he's been scooting off, slipping off like that, and you guys have been having to fill in for him. We're going to have to cut his pay. And is uh, David got any headphones? Can he hear us, or is, are we? Can he, David? Can you hear me? No. <laughs> oh man, you guys need two sets of earphones. Did we do any? I just, I gotta, I gotta stretch the other one way over here. Well, I what? Need to get another. What happened to him? What happened to Dad? No, what happened to your other earphone headphones? Oh, they're they're over here near the uh, near the computer where I'm doing all of the. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't get as close to that mic as Ted did. Well, look, hey, what are you guys doing here? I know you guys uh, uh, have jobs during the day and 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 uh, and are really busy, and we really appreciate your help uh, on the show at, on, on Tuesday nights and helping Ted get set up there. So, uh, you got anything uh, special going? I know you guys are going to be in Huntsville. Yep, getting ready to, uh, working on my van, getting all of the, uh, doing a tune-up on it right now, making sure it's ready to go for uh, going down to Huntsville, Alabama. Man. And I'll uh, remove all of my seats, put all of the equipment in there, all the furniture, and uh, go down there and have some fun. Well, you know, you got, that's a lot of work what you do. Uh, you carry all, you carry the whole studio almost, the, the, the the board and the desk and all that stuff. And uh, I know it's a big job. It's a big job w with what we take down here. But I, I can't believe you haul that big desk down here. Uh, what, what can I say? I enjoy the punishment. Yeah, well, oh, man. I just hope the weather's good because uh, doesn't part of the thing have to stick out your window? It, it does. Uh, we've gotten rained on twice, uh, but then I just grab a, a – bring a trash bag with me and uh, put it over. Uh-huh. Uh, over the part that's sticking out, it gets really loud when you when you're driving it, you know, 65, 70 with a trash bag. I imagine so. Thumping in the breeze. I imagine so. Okay. Well, uh, hey, uh, uh, I, I think uh, last week you guys went out to the transmitter out there. You were having some trouble. Now, David and Matt helped take care of this hundred thousand watt transmitter out there, and. Uh, uh, Let's uh, let's talk to uh, let's let's talk to Matt a minute. Now, Matt, when you drive up to the uh, Shore Wave Station in your car, you've got an HF rig in your car, and you've got to disconnect the antenna and turn your HF radio off, don't you? What what happens, man? Well, if I don't, the uh, DX70 has a um, there's a relay section inside there that clicks going through all the different frequencies, and whatever frequency it was on last, it's uh, the relay literally gets welded to that frequency um, driving through there. Um, a lot of people don't realize that there's, you know, you know 100,000 watts to the antenna, you know, is the equivalent of, you know, several million in the air. When you drive by it, uh, you can have interesting things like I did where you have the uh, coil packs literally melt to the chassis of the engine. Uh, where the spark plugs connect to. Oh, I hadn't thought I about that. Some of these electronic cars might shut down if they drive under the antennas there, right? Yeah. Yeah, any new car I drive, uh, I usually grab the wheel and go way back like that because I'm almost afraid that the airbag is going to deploy. I've often worried about driving underneath that thing and getting whacked in the face by an airbag. Oh, man, hey, I I'm even worried about that. You put a new a new uh, uh, Two meter or four forty rig in a in one of these new cars. I've always uh, uh, hesitant to key the microphone the first time because I can just see an airbag pop out. But you've got you've got more serious problems with that with that power there. It's a hundred thousand watts. You've got three rhombic antennas out there, and I think I believe I read somewhere where they have like eighteen dB gain. I think if you look at the effective yep. radiated power, that's like six point two or six point four. Uh, uh, megawatts or something like that. Yeah, it's it's yeah. There's a little RF going to the uh, yeah. going, going to the air there. Uh, and the, the dangerous part is is uh, you know when you're driving, you just 
if if you do have a vehicle that does have issues, um, if you're trying to go uphill, obviously that becomes an issue. We've had people's vehicles stall out. Uh, we've had people's computers get fried in the vehicles. Um, we do actually every once in a while we'll get a car company call us and say, uh, I won't mention their names, but they'll call us and they'll want to come out there and actually test uh, the vehicles in the RF environment to see if they have any issues, oh, which cool. is kind of funny. That's cool. It's kind of like, yeah. So they'll bring a new car out there and drive it around under your antennas. Yeah, trying to see if it will uh, uh, lose its marbles. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I tell you, I was real impressed with the station when I saw it uh, last month. And uh, um, someday we need to do a video. You guys need to shoot a video and give us a tour of it. And yeah, we'll we'll play it back here. Oh, yeah. It's, it's uh it's 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 quite an amazing facility. Those those hundred kilowatt transmitters, each one of them have their own personality. Uh, we could give them all names, um, but you know they've been pretty good at this point. I mean, we haven't we've had very little trouble out of them um, once we uh, went through them and you know basically restored things to the way the manufacturer wants it, things of that nature. And the way that we, these design engineers and they design something, they design it a certain way. And uh, modifying things like that in the field is usually not a great idea, especially when you're dealing with those power levels because you can, uh, I mean, the, the modulator stacks in those things, if you could imagine uh, 50 switching high-voltage power supplies switching to generate the high voltage that comes into the, to the tube, that's where you get your high voltage in the tube, all those things switching simultaneously, you, the control circuitry even for that, is uh, very complex and very complicating. I mean, so you've are, got, those, are those power supplies, are they like series or something? You don't have a single 50,000 volt power supply, do you? I mean, no, though they're all, they're all ganged together uh -huh. and then they come into the tube. So, wow. Okay. All right. Well, any, uh, any last things you guys want to talk about here? We got to get you on a show more here. Well, I, I enjoyed seeing the oscilloscope. I'm thinking about ordering one of those. Uh, cool, but he said it only hit a 200k bandwidth. Isn't that what you said, Joe? Yeah, it's about 200 kilohertz uh, on this one, but uh, uh, they're getting better. And uh, they even sell a scope that's not a kit that looks like a cell phone, and and it's around fifty dollars. And like I said, the case looks like a cell phone, and it charges like a cell phone, and looks like one. But it, you plug in a, a little probe into it, and away it goes. A pocket-sized scope, uh, but it's not a kit. Uh, this one is. Um, but uh, as things go, it won't take long before uh, it'll be well high enough to easily be used for HF. Okay. Well, we're going to go ahead and jump over to uh, our real informal part for our Amateur Radio Roundtable. This is where we use Google Hangout. And anybody who wants to get on the show can get on the show tonight. All I got to do is click on that link I just sent out. Let me send it again here. And uh, if they'll click on that link, and if they have a camera and a Google account, we'll have their video on the show. I'm expecting Shelby on there maybe tonight. Uh, we did a story about Hamlet Forward here uh, a few weeks ago, and we got uh, Shelby his own... Uh, tech study light study course and he's been studying it and we want to get a progress report and he's usually in here so maybe Shelby can give us a report so we're going to go ahead and sign out with you guys and we're going to go over and try to get on Google Hangout if you guys want to get on it join us and uh, we'll see you uh, well I was going to say we'll see you next week but uh, we'll see all you guys uh, Friday probably down in Huntsville Alabama sounds great I enjoy seeing you we'll see you in Huntsville all right we'll see thanks. if I can get in the Google chat all right, thanks everybody. Save me three. Okay, uh, well that was uh, that was good. I'm glad we got. Uh, I'm glad we were able to uh, get David and Matt on there and talk a little about uh, uh, their support of the WTWW shortwave transmitter. Those guys keep that transmitter going all the time. They go out there in the middle of the night. Uh, let me see if I can bring up uh, the uh, Google Hangout and see if I can get on it. And we'll see if anybody wants to join us tonight. Yeah, 
And it looks like we've got maybe one person on there. I don't know. Looks like Joe maybe is on there. Maybe some others will join us here in a minute. Hey, Joe, how you doing? You don't have any audio. Uh, up at the top, click your audio uh, mute button. Did you click your... Nope, still no audio, Joe. Are you, let's see. Joe, you're, you're muted. Up at the top, up at the top, you have to unmute it. Now, now you're not muted, but you have no audio. Okay, let's while you're looking at your audio, let's just check Freddie out there. Freddie, how you doing? I see Freddie Diaz, YV5QF has joined us. Freddie, are you there, Freddie? Hello, Freddie. Well, okay, I think I got the audio. Yeah, you got Fred. your audio now. You got. I see. Uh, I see. Freddie came in, but I don't hear him. Oh, Freddie. Uh, Freddie, you there? Freddie, your mic's not working. Okay, how's the audio? Uh, level? Yours is doing good, Joe. Yours is doing fine. Uh, let me see. Yeah, there's yeah, Freddie. We got so we got a picture on Freddie now. I, I need to. Uh, trying to open the mic on the camera, which yeah. I have disabled. So. I, I need to adjust you guys' camera shot here because. Uh, oh, let's see. Uh, that's a little better right there. You guys were coming in at a different camera angle there. There we go. That's a little better. So. Got your mic fixed. Uh, Freddie, how you doing, Freddie? Fred, come on, Freddie, talk to me, Freddie. No audio, Freddie. No. You know, Freddie is a good engineer, but sometimes he forgets to plug his microphone in. <laughs> Thank you. So, Freddie, you're going to have to work on your microphone and... Uh, uh, Google's got that little green bar down at the bottom uh, of your picture, and uh, just uh, start yelling. And if that little green bar moves, you'll know you got audio. And look at there, there's Jill. Jill joined us. Hey, Jill. Well, nobody's wanting to talk tonight. Well, Joe, until they get ready to talk, we're just going to stick with you then. Okay. I have some other gadgets around here. I found this in a flea market. It looks like a cell phone, but it's yeah. a solar panel. Oh, it is. And That's cool. It's a, you can see on the side, it's actually a cell phone charger. You just leave it out in the sun, and it charges it up, and uh, you can charge your cell phone from that. It's kind of a nifty little deal. It also works with these QRP radios that only take uh, 5 volts. Um, I've got all sorts of gadgets. Um Really looking forward to uh, seeing everybody in Huntsville. I don't know if I ever showed this. This is the Fifi SDR. Okay. The Fifi SDR. Okay. Cool. Yeah, this comes from Germany, and I brought it back last year from Friedrichshafen, and it's an SDR kit that any kit builder can put together in maybe. I know that sounds strange, cool. but. Got that green bar down the bottom uh, of your picture. And, uh, just start yelling. A green bar moves okay, and somebody, audio. somebody has their show audio turned up. You need to okay. turn down the uh, webcast audio. You do that under the video window, the speaker. Just mute the speaker on the show okay, audio. Okay, can you still see the SDR? Yeah, we, we can see it. Looks good. Okay, this one uh, is designed for HF, and it has switchable uh, pre-selectors in it. And uh, it's mostly surface mount. And there's maybe five or six through-hole parts that you put in it and put uh -huh. it in a box. And that's a kit. So uh, it's it's only about 15 minutes of assembly, and it's all done because the rest is super tiny uh, surface mount that's already pre-mounted on the main board. All you're doing basically is putting the connectors on it, the switch, and putting it in the case. And uh, it works quite well on HF. I've hooked it up to my outside antennas, and uh, it works quite well. Um, let's let's see let's see if uh, Jill has got her microphone working yet. Uh, Jill, you there? I guess so. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, you're coming in good, Jill. How how you doing tonight? Doing pretty good. Just getting ready to leave tomorrow. All right, you're gonna you're heading down to Huntsville. I guess we'll see you down there, right? 
most definitely. All right. And how how uh, how far is it for you to travel? Uh, I think about seven hours, but I'm going to make a stop in Nashville. Uh -huh. And it's probably about a total of nine hours tomorrow. Well, wow. That's like us going to Dayton. That's a, that's a long, long, a long ways. Well, I'm glad you're getting there now. You, you were, yeah, have you been attending Huntsville before? You've been here before, right? Last year was my first. I thought so, yeah. All right. Well, we're going to see you there for sure. Looking forward to it. All right. Well, I don't know why other people are having trouble tonight. Oh, there's Freddy. Freddy's back in. Freddy, how you doing, Freddy? You, your mic's muted, Freddy. There you go. Freddy, say something, Freddy. Now, here's our chief engineer. Here's Freddy, our chief engineer, and he can't even make his microphone work. You believe that? Look at there. I can call him all kinds of names. Watch this. Watch this. I'm going to call Freddy all kinds of names. He can't talk back to me. Freddy, you look like a two faced pot belly baboon that couldn't catch a cold the wind was blowing. <laughs> See there? He can't talk. He can't. Huh? There he is. Are you there? Fog. No, wait a minute. That's, uh, who's that? That's, uh, I don't know who Jeff. that is. Jeffrey. Hey, Jeffrey, your, your camera's not working tonight. As usual. You know, last week it worked. <clears throat> I can't figure this stuff out. I don't know, man. I don't know what's going on here. Unbelievable. Right, I'll let you guys carry on. Well, yeah, hey, work on it. Hey, at least your audio's working. So we got Jeffrey on there. We got Freddie in there. Jill in there. Joe's in there. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, W9 TOT, he, yeah, he, he made a comment. Freddie can't hear me, but he could make a gesture back at me, so I got to be careful there. Uh, okay, now I see, uh, I see Jeff's, uh, picture, his face, a still picture. I don't know if you got a camera there or not. All right, we got a few people joining us here. Sounds messed Freddy, up. Uh, that, Freddie that, says he's the victim of Windows 10. Yeah? Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, Freddie's sound is messed up. Don't be knocking that Windows 10. What was that, Jill? Don't be knocking that Windows 10. Well, hey, I got several free upgrades here, but I'm afraid to do it. I, I, I don't know if I want to take that step or not. I did I it to my no laptop. To it yeah. Hey, uh, for people in the chat laptop. room watching right now, the audio <laughs> is going to be up and down a little bit. We got different people coming in with different audios, so. Uh, it's probably not going to be as perfect as it was on the show, but uh, it's uh, it's still cool the way we can bring we can bring up to ten people uh, in Hangout. We can bring up to ten people at at the same time into our webcast here. And right now we've got only one, two, three. We only got four. So guys, we can we can take six more people. So come on and uh, come on and join us. You got to have a Google Plus account. And with the Google Plus account, all you have to do is just log into uh, that link, or not even log in, just click on that link that I sent out. I think this is the first time Jill has joined us. Yes. And it's working good. And I'm going to have to leave soon. Did you have any trouble? Uh, did you already have a Google account? Yes. Okay. No problems at all getting in. Nice to see you, Jill. Ha <laughs> ha. Nice to see you, too. Uh, you're not saving me. <laughs> well, sort of, kind of. <laughs> In a minute. Well, I'll figure it out. Well, Jeffrey, you know, when he first started <laughs> talking with us, the camera worked great. He's got a beautiful shaft. I really love seeing it. And then the next thing, his camera went out. He couldn't make his camera work. Uh, last week, he got his camera working, but something weird is going on here. Hey, Freddie, right. what do you got going, man? Now, Freddie is a... Freddie, Freddie's other hobby is uh, uh, looking at the stars and stuff like that, man. Freddie's got all these telescopes and tripods, and he goes out and takes pictures of, you know, Mars and all this stuff. Freddie, anything going on uh, here right now that we ought to be looking for? Uh-oh. I'm not hearing any audio. All right, I don't, uh, well, maybe Freddie's not hearing me. Isn't it amazing how some stuff works and some stuff doesn't work? Wow. It's horrible. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, tomorrow uh, I have a normal work day, and then we have our local club meeting. Our local ham radio club here in Lincoln uh, brings in about 80 to 90 members for a normal monthly meeting, which is pretty amazing. So uh, I've had to pack all my stuff for Huntsville already.